Hey everyone, welcome to Logan Smosh Pig. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for tuning in to a new episode of Rock and Read. Today we will read Chapter 2 of My F and Life by Getty Lee. Chapter 2 is called Grieving. Here we go. Everything in my life came to a standstill. My mother's grief knew no bounds. She was devastated. And although life did carry on, she never fully recovered in her heart. Over the years, every visit she ever made to Dad's gravesite left her as inconsolable as the day he died. Our household became a discombobulated mass of neighbors, relatives, and religious elders coming and going without cease. In the old country before the war, my mother's side of the family had been Orthodox Jews, which required them, and especially me as the eldest male child, to observe strict rules for grieving. These stages of mourning affected me profoundly, and I believe set the stage for my life to come. For, let me tell you, we know how to grieve. We are awesome at it, as if misery were second nature to us. Immediately after burial, we said Shiva for about seven days, usually at the home of the bereaved. We cover up all mirrors as a reminder that this is not about us, but the one who has passed away. We sit on low chairs or remove pillows and cushions from the sofas. I've never been able to determine the exact reason for that. I assume it's to ensure we are uncomfortable and reminded that loss is painful. For seven days, we're supposed to not leave the house, except on Shabbat to synagogue. We don't work, shave, or cut our hair. We don't bathe other than for essential hygiene. Don't wear cosmetics, leather shoes, or new clothing. No festivities are permitted, nor sexual relations, as if nor even any study that gives you pleasure. After the Shiva, there's a 30-day period of mourning called Shalashim, an easing back into semi-normal life. But, as the eldest son, it was also my duty to say Kaddish, the prayer for the dead, three times a day, for 11 months and a day. This I did without fail. During such a period, you may partake in celebrations only so long as there is no music. So when I had my bar mitzvah the following summer, it was devoid of music and dancing. Thankfully, you were not forbidden to accept envelopes of money from relatives. As part of a regular Jewish upbringing, most kids in my hood went to cheater, either full-time or like me, after school between four and six, a couple days a week, and on Sunday. But I hated it. I found it pointless in the world I wanted to live in. Hebrew was a language that struck me as existing only in dusty books and scrolls, and I found it hypocritical that the teachers didn't seem to care if we understood the actual words. Their reciting them phonetically at the bar mitzvah ceremony was good enough. They were brutal in metting out corporal punishment, throwing chalk at you for the slightest infraction, not an environment, in my humble opinion, in which to build a trusting and devoted rapport. The moment my dad passed away, and there was no longer any male authority figure in the house to enforce my attendance, I resolved to quit. Needless to say, my mom was disappointed in me, even crestfallen. My aunts and uncles berated me for my newfound acts of independence, or as they saw it, defiance. Not just quitting cheater, but growing my hair longer and hanging around with goyish friends. One day, even as my family and I were visiting my father's gravesite, they started in on me. I remember one uncle saying, You're killing your mother, you rebel, you delinquent. I was to obey without argument, and when I wouldn't, they ganged up on me. 
Not a single adult relative asked me how I was dealing with my loss, other than the occasional aunt who might swipe the bangs out of my face and say, You poor boy, be a good son and cut your hair. Not one so much as asked me, Are you okay? I never fully forgave them, and have never, ever forgotten the way that one of an uncle crossed the line while I was standing in front of my own father's grave. Fact is, to this day, I have a long memory for people who treated me badly. My mother's pain and bereavement sucked the air out of every room in the house. Please don't get me wrong. I felt deeply for her being left with the loss of the love of her life and three children to protect, a mortgage and a business to run, but it took me years to forgive my uncles and aunts for their indifference to me at that fragile time. Indeed, part of me never has. I know they were grieving my dad's loss too, trying to be supportive of my mom while laboring to rebuild their own families and keep alive traditions that had been pummeled by the horrors of war. They would never recover entirely from the Holocaust. But I was only 12, and my life too had changed in the blink of an eye, and it felt to me all too readily accepted that I, and my sister and little brother were simply collateral damage that we would have to learn to look out for ourselves. Enter Max Gutman, a kind, generous, and pious man in his early 50s with a thick Hungarian accent, who as it happened was also grieving his recently deceased parents. He volunteered to pick me up every morning and afternoon and accompany me to the synagogue where he taught me how to behave in shul and how to say all the prayers and sing their mournful melodies. A musical influence of a very different kind. He showed me consideration and treated me as a young adult, learning to cope with new responsibilities. He also helped me prepare for my own bar mitzvah in that same year of grieving. Today, I am a man, and all that. After a time, I believe that Max started to see himself as a surrogate father figure. I think he liked me, but like a lot of religious people, was mainly trying to do what was right for the community, and specifically for my mother. But I wasn't having it. I had been growing my hair almost with a vengeance, and one day he took it upon himself to intercede. On the way home from morning services, he said, Let me take you to my barber. You don't have to cut it short. Let's just clean it up a bit. Perhaps my mother had asked him to. I don't know. She'd certainly been bugging me about it as much as every other adult I knew, including the school principal, Mr. Church. Perfect name, eh? A royal pain in the butt. A regular tyrant who made us stand nose to the wall for an hour or more. If he caught us in the halls with our shirts not tucked into our trousers, or if we dared to grow our hair long enough to touch the back of our collar. It seems almost quaint now, but Mr. Church... Max, my uncles, all of them saw my hair as the beginning of rebellion and wanted to crush it, quite literally nip it in the bud, before it became a real problem. So I sat in the barber's chair, but informed the man as sternly as I could that I only wanted a trim. He said okay, but then I caught Max's reflection in the mirror, his hand making a motion to cut it all off. I freaked, jumped up, and stormed away in outrage, shouting at him that he was a liar, and reminding him that he was not my father. After that outburst, he backed off, and our relationship suffered, which was a shame, because I did feel some kindness and gratitude towards him for what he was doing for Mom. The time he took to help instruct me, and never laying guilt on me as viciously as my uncles did. I have to hand it to him. Max was creative. He asked a cantor he knew to make a recording of the Torah portions I was supposed to learn for my bar mitzvah. My first gig, I guess. A cantor, in case you don't know, is the vocalizing counterpart to a rabbi, the one who sings the psalms and prayers during the service. A much cooler job than rabbi, if you ask me. So I memorized all the Hebrew words, the traditional melodies, and the vocal nuances off this recording. And on the day I was called to the Torah, 
I managed to recite the entire program by heart, sort of pretending to read it. I saw Mom smiling proudly through her tears in the front row, and my relatives were now saying, Boy, such a lovely voice. You should be a cantor. I nodded my head and gratefully took their envelopes of bar mitzvah money while thinking to myself, Yeah, right. But sorry, folks. I'm done with all that. My mother may have been crying tears of joy that day, but there was no real exploring faith with her or anyone else in my family. It was all dogmatic and unintellectual. There was nothing to discuss. They simply did as they had been taught. How dare I even question it? There was one direction only. Doing what Jews were expected to do and behaving how Jews were expected to behave. Children in the old world were to be seen and not heard. Anything more was disrespectful and a reason to be punished with the stick of shame. My mother in particular knew how to weld that stick with precision. Of course, in time, I realized that faith for them was a way of keeping the dead alive, a tribute to them, an assertion that they had not perished in vain. And in more practical terms, these survivors were committed to rebuilding the Jewish population. For the vast majority of observant Jews, the mantra was and remains, get married, have lots of kids, and keep them faithful to the religion. Thus, it's not just a matter of the past, but the future too. So yes, in time, I did come to understand that that's what drove them, but I still could not bring myself to feel the same way. Please understand, I love being a Jew, and I'm super proud of all that my people have accomplished in so many aspects of life, especially in the face of persistent prejudice, hatred, and outright murder. But I consider myself a devout cultural Jew. I love the history, the humor, and even some of the food. But a belief in God and organized religion? Not for me. A line from Woody Allen's Love and Death sums up my feelings well. If it turns out that there is a God, the worst you can say about him is that basically, he's an underachiever. The fact that all three of Mom's children would eventually marry out of the faith was in her mind a heartbreaking failure of her own parenting skills. Even after I'd become an adult, she tried to guilt me back into synagogue. She'd say that by not being observant, I was committing a sin against God and betraying my family and all those who had died in the war. But it was to no avail. I had prayed for the last time. Surprisingly, once the penny dropped that we were not going to change, she did too. It's a testament to her innate intelligence and maturity that she'd learned to accept and even embrace people for who they are. She'd grown fiercely devoted to her daughters-in-law and adored them unquestionably till the day she died. I find that hugely admirable for someone of her age and with her past and wonder if I would have had the strength to change as she did. My sister also struggled mightily after Dad died. She was the firstborn, his little girl, and clearly had enjoyed a deeper relationship with him than I. She was 14 when he passed, already in the throes of adolescence, and his death hit her that much more viscerally. She tried to escape the household at every opportunity, lashing out and staying out worryingly late. As the man of the house, as everyone loved to remind me, I had to stand up for mom which led to more fights. I too was itching to escape, particularly after my synagogue duties were over. I was percolating beneath the surface, starting to reject adults at every turn. And as soon as my 11 months of mourning were over, I spent less time at home and sought out a new breed of friends. In 1966, I started at Fisherville Junior High in New York, just walking distance from our house. It was also there that Susie started hanging out with some tough guys, greasers as we called them. At R.J. Lang throughout my year of woe, I'd continued to be one of the school's most popular punching bags. But in the first semester at this new place, as I was walking home, and one of these kids grabbed me by the lapels, winding up to make my life even more of a misery, another kid said, Hey, 
Leave him alone. That's Susie's little brother. Phew. Big sister to the rescue. And then, when I made friends with a guy I shared a couple classes with, a good-natured guy with a cheeky grin named Steve Shutt, the harassment period petered out altogether. How come? Well, Shuddy was a rising hockey star, even in grade 7. He was reserved, super cool, and just by association with him, my kosher bacon was saved. If you're a hockey fan, you know he went on to become a perennial all-star for the Montreal Canadiens as part of the devastating offensive line alongside Guy Lafleur and Jacques Lemaire, scoring a career 424 goals and in 1993 was elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame. He was a year older than me, so we had only a few mutual friends, but we dug the same music and would soon both develop an interest in the bass guitar. He was growing his hair then too, and in the 60s, man, those with long hair bonded instantly. He'd grow it out every summer, cutting it all off again without hesitation as soon as the hockey season began. He knew his priorities. I'm not sure if Steve was actually aware of being my savior. We never spoke of it, but our friendship did allow me to walk amongst the bullies with impunity. By now, I wouldn't be surprised if you were hoping for the juicy rock and roll bits, the story of Rush to begin. I will tell you all about it, but I'm afraid that first, a few more heavies are in order. In the next chapter, I'm going to relate my parents' experiences of the war. After all, if it wasn't for what happened to them then, I wouldn't be here to tell you my tale now, and I wouldn't be the person who I am. A lot of what loomed over me as a boy went into forging my own personality, my value system, the good things, and the bad. But most important, I feel both duty-bound and honored to tell you their story, for their sake. If you find it half as harrowing to read as I did writing it, you may be tempted to skip right along. If you do, I won't blame you, and I'll see you in chapter 4. But I've included it in this book because I feel we're living in an era that seems to have forgotten what can and will happen when fascism rears its head. I think we all need reminding of it in the face of those who either deny the past or never knew about it in the first place. Well, that's the end of chapter two. And now, you have some idea of what to expect in chapter three. Let me know what you thought of this chapter in the comments below. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Till then, rock on.